Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I can't see anyone, so I'm hoping that um, as you're coming in, you will um, you'll be joining us. Welcome to Portal uh, and the first of our Sunday morning panel sessions. What's the point of public art? It will be moderated by Harriet Gaffney, who will be joined on the panel with renowned public artists, Rowena Martinik, Julie Shields, Grant Fink and Glenn Romanus. I'm Karen Steenbergen and I'm one of the Surf Coast Arts Trail local area coordinators. Uh, my specific area is Aries Fairhaven and the Lawn area. I will be your Zoom host today. If you have any problems, please just send me a message on the chat function. Bear with me, it's my first session, so hopefully we'll get this webinar working nice and smoothly this morning. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the lands on which this session will be held today. Portal is brought to you live from the traditional lands of the Wadarung and Eastern Ma peoples of the Kulin Nations. We acknowledge their ancestors who cared for the land, rivers and sea and all things living for thousands of generations and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. I would now like to introduce our renowned artists, Rowena Martinik, creating vast dynamic explorations of colour is abstract expressionist Rowena Martinik's forte. Rowena has carved out her position in the art world, spanning the realms of public art, painting installations, permanent and temporary interventions, murals within streetscapes, or inspiring architectural applications and powerful compositions on canvas. Rowena continues to push the boundaries within the public and private art sectors, transforming once ordinary spaces into luscious colorscapes. Our second panelist is Julie Shields. Julie makes work for both the gallery and public space. Her sculptural and photographic artworks aim to bring into focus material things and physical spaces that are hidden, undervalued, disappearing or slipping from view. Th throughout her career, Julie has been both an artist and project manager, often working collaboratively with culturally diverse communities, museums and art organisations, including the Jewish Museum, Immigration Museum and with local councils, Banyul, Albury, Bayside and City of Port Phillip. Our third artist is Grant Fink. Grant started his professional career as a sculptor and ceramicist in the late 1970s. Grant has accumulated over 40 years of full-time studio practice in the visual arts completing 28 public commissions and has built an extensive exhibition history, working with, de with deliberate conceptual intent, coupled with well-developed technical skills. Grant has been able to transcend many technical constraints, giving him the freedom to develop unique processes to articulate concepts that revolve around themes of personal and collective identity. And our final speaker today is Glenn Romanus, Glenn is a working practitioner individually and through collaboration for over 25 years. Glenn has created over 200 permanent temporary and ephemeral public art projects. Glenn's career has involved various kinds of media and context, always trying to reveal the relationship between storytelling and the environment. Interviewing our wonderful artist today will be Harriet Gaffney, who's the Surf Coast Shire's Arts Development Officer and Artistic Director of Portal. Harriet's career as a creative producer began in the early 2000s. She helped fund and produce the Alice Desert Festival and worked as project manager on the Darwin Festival. After moving to Bali in 2008, she worked in communications for both the Bali Spirit Festival and the UBUD Readers and Writers Festival. Since returning to Australia, she has completed a master's in professional writing and worked for Writers Victoria, as well as freelanced as a literary professional for festivals across Australia. Before I pass back 
to Harriet. I'd like to encourage everyone through the chat function that if you can think of any questions um, during our conversation, pop them up and I will make a note of them. Um, I'm going to give Harriet at about 12 o'clock the heads up that we've got about 15 more minutes of, of chatting and then at 12.15 I will start to um, ask some questions of, of our panellists for you. So sit back, I've got my cup of tea and my egg on toast that I haven't quite finished that I'm going to enjoy <laughs> while um, we listen to an amazing conversation, handing over to Harriet. Thanks, Karen. I hope you enjoy your egg. Maybe if you just turn your sound off so that we don't. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, like, likewise, I would like also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this place and the place that uh, Portal has been sort of grown on across the lands of the Wadarong and Eastern Ma people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I think I'll start by sort of linking into the time that we're in. And I think that COVID has been remarkable for helping us to understand the mental health and well-being impacts of creativity, something that was definitely in our minds as we've been, you know, formulating the program for Portal. But I reckon it's probably fair to say that there's still a lack of recognition at all levels of public life around the wider role that art plays in communities. So that's why today's session will investigate some of the objectives of public art, including how it can help regional areas recover from economic downturn and uncertainty if embraced. Um, this is generally neatly encapsulated by a term that's become a bit of a buzzword in the last decade or so, placemaking. Um, one that's been used by urban planners, bureaucrats and artists in particular. So I might just throw quickly to the entire panel right now and say, can anyone jump in with a quick interpretation of what placemaking means? Julie, I'm going to grab you now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, every, every um, place has its own unique sense of identity. And sometimes that goes unbidden and is often hidden. And I suppose in terms of the practice of um, artists assisting the definition of what a place is, um, um, it's, it's an engagement with the people in that place, the uh, sense of what the physical, material and geological, historical place is and then bringing that into view by um, creative artworks. Thank you very much. Um, I, I reckon it's really important at this stage to note that placemaking is not a new thing. Cultures have been making their spaces places that speak about who they are and what's important to them for tens of thousands of years, you know, formatively here in Australia more than any other place, but then in cultures like Mesopotamia, you know, the Egyptians the Greeks, the Romans, etc. Like it's something that's been actively done, but we haven't really turned our gaze to it until the last couple of decades, I would say. So I want to look at some of the elements that are inherent to placemaking. And I'd just like to say something just on that, if I could, please. Yeah, if absolutely. That's possible. Um, placemaking also is not a prescriptive process. I think it's often generational and it really is a conglomeration of a whole bunch of influences come together to create identity. So I, I don't see that um, there's, a, there's a one single process and I often see it as a, a long-term ongoing organic thing and that we make a contribution to that but we don't create it as such. As yeah, artists. absolutely. Absolutely, I would agree with you. Um, we're going to focus in on that sort of, you know, what it is that public art, however, is you know, some of the main sort of the primary elements of it and what it's trying to achieve. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Rowena, because um, as the first artist whose work we'll look at, because I think that possibly one of the, you know, the primary elements is its ability to invigorate public space. And I think your work really actively sort of, you know, <laughs> exudes that. Um, you know, so it's about getting people to move, move through it, to give them a place to locate around, to engender energy. So Rowena, throwing to you, you've recently completed works with your partner, Jeffrey in um, both Bendigo and Nidri. And I wanted to take a look at some of those images now. So everyone, please bear with me while I, you know, go and try and find how to share my screen. I had it all set up and then we had a few tech issues. So 
Hmm. Let's share this and see. No, I seem to be sharing. Can you see anything, everyone? No. Okay. I'm going to try it this way. Seeing anything now? No. I'm not pressing the right button. Excuse me, everyone. I've got my phone with my notes on it. There we go. I've got my phone with my notes on it and things, and I'm hiding things from myself. So, Rowena, looking at this, this tell us a little bit about this work. So this is the Nidri project. It's yep. a, a pretty large mural that I painted with Jeffrey. Um, and it's at the gateway of the Nidri shopping strip. And we were commissioned to do this by the Traders Association because they really felt there was value in creating a gateway work to bring awareness to the location. And uh, they saw that we could do that through my use of, use of colour and colour saturation, gesture, movement, and also Jeffrey's work also brings about like a very recognisable aspect to the work for people who can't necessarily feel that they want to read abstract expressionism. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so this piece was 30 metres long by about nine metres high. So it was visible from like a kilometre up the road yeah. um, as well as um, being the first thing you see when you get off the tram at the location. It was across the road from the library and yeah, almost like a, a signpost to the location. For the yeah. yeah. So the traders commissioned that work from you. What was their intent? What did they want to do? What did they want? Like, you know, let's sort of pretend that this has all been, you know, we've removed all of the artwork from it. What was the space like prior to it? And what were the the, what was the Traders Association hoping to achieve? With getting so, prior, so this back, this building was a kebab shop. So it was really just a big pale pink wall that had a bit of signage on it, but didn't really say anything about the location. Um, and I, I guess what they wanted to do was really activate the location and bring an awareness that this was a place to visit. So um, Has it been successful? You know, what's the feedback been in well, regards to that activation? We, from the general passing by, people were loving it. They're they loving that there was something there, something to engage with, something to invigorate their experience of just walking down the street. So trans, transforming a space that really was something that you would ordinarily just walk past in mm. gave gave something to contemplate, momentary sort of engagement. And I guess also something for the locals to identify with and um, to, to claim as their own in a way. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move on to um, the next image we've got from another work that you did recently. Just bear with me while I work out how to drive this. Everyone, I have done the tech stuff on this, but for some reason I don't seem able. Oops. Glenn, we've jumped to your work. Ah, oh, okay. Um, this work is in Bendigo, yeah? Is that right, Rowena? Yep. So this is a portion of the wall um, of the work that I did collaboratively with Jeffrey. This is prior to his involvement in the work. Um, so this is a 52 metre long piece that spans basically the length of the city block from King Street to Queen Street in Bendigo. And it was really about activating a laneway that people would walk through, people would go through here on their journey from the station to the CBD. Um, but it was not exactly a pleasant place to visit. A lot of the uh, local thieves would dump their, their packaging in the laneway after they'd been to Target and, you know, where the kids would go to smoke some weed and it was really about making this a very transient space into an experience so yeah. bringing it to life with color gesture the mood like imbuing the space with movement and those abstract gestures and colors like carrying you through the space that i mean that sounds it can sound a little bit sort of um without real 
Uh, it's difficult sometimes to work out what the tangible benefits of, of actions like this are. But when you talk about a space that has been sort of co-opted by people who are on the fringes of societies, you know, people with, you know, whether it's, you know, people who are homeless or people who, you know, for whatever reasons are, you know, doing things that are seen as below the law, et cetera. When you trans transform a space like this, what does it bring to that space? You know, so if people, if it was only those sorts of people hanging out there before? Well, I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of a couple of examples. Like there's some riders, there's this phenomenon called bikes against walls where cyclists can't, they, they ride to a destination, take a photograph of their bikes and themselves against the walls and then go and have a coffee at a local cafe and then move on. Like um, I'd never heard of it before, but while Jeffrey was finishing his contribution to the mural, um, that's what happened. And then since, since the mural's been finished, three like quite established street photographers have visited the area just to document, to document the work. So um, Bendigo have been like producing marketing material to bring tourists to, to visit Bendigo street art. So it's, it's about bringing people in to engage and giving it just another layer to the city. Mm. To, um, to experience yeah absolutely but for me like one of the things I think about in regards to this is also you know a really tangible aspect of this is safety too you know like mm -hmm. as women I think particularly we really do understand what drab unloved spaces in urban environments you know what they feel like to walk around you don't feel particularly like the older you get it's easier but you know like when you're younger, et cetera, walking through spaces that are quite obviously unloved and uncared about, you know, can really have issues around safety, et cetera. And that gathering of people around spaces, does it have impacts beyond, you know, the location itself? You know, does it, does it generate impacts? You know, if we go back to the Nidri work, that was the traders, you know, put in money to pay for that work. What do you think they were hoping to see? Would, are there any flow-on effects, do you think? I just think really what they wanted to be seen as vibrant a place to visit as, say, a shopping mall that has security guards and is well lit and that is very much does have a sense of security. Um, but also, I think, to be seen as a unique destination not mm. just a generic mm. um, run-of-the-mill place. This and, and our work was um, additional to other pieces that they had commissioned, like they'd commissioned a series of billboards that were um, changing sort of every six to 12 months as well. So there were quite a few layers of engagement on the, the level of visual artworks. And they've sort of, in many ways, they've revivified, like if we go to Bendigo as well, they've re, they're looking to actively revivify their township, aren't they, through getting different sorts of arts, public art there. Yeah, they're, I think, it, again, it's sort of just building layers, like having, they've got an extremely vibrant gallery. Um, so they're constantly building on, so the tourism around, around that, and um, and each year they, the the local council partners with local business to bring in another layer to that through a public mm. art project. Fabulous. Um, I'm gonna. I've just pulled up this image here, which I adore. This work. Um, I just think it the way that it lights up. You know, literally lights up space whether it's during the night or during the day yeah. how um how how do you think works like this impact a space and help turn you know space itself into place a place that people want to gather and be a part of well i've always thought of this this is quite an old piece now like this was my master's research work um at RMIT University. And I kind of always saw this piece as a bit of a beacon. Um, during the day, it was 
really it just appeared as a, a very large explosion of color on the side of a building. And then at nighttime, um, a lot, it was like a light box, but it also could be experienced as you went into the building, like mm. every stained glass window. So there's a lot of sort of layers to, to how this work could be experienced. But ideally for me, it was about making the experience of art a really accessible thing. It wasn't something held closely by those who could afford it or you didn't have to go into a gallery space that you might feel a bit uncomfortable about. It's just something that would, you could turn, go around the corner and it would pleasantly interrupt your day and like give you a, an experience that you weren't necessarily expecting and um, perhaps a, a feeling of joy, even if though it might be just momentary, just just a shift in your daily experience. And, and I guess also just interrupting that, that urban mundanity, like urban grey space. So interrupting that with colour. Fabulous. You're, you're talking about um, the immersive experience of public art, you know, the way that we experience it as people in, you know, our locations. So I'm going to shift focus for a moment and, um, and move on to you, Glenn, because I think that public art can likewise play a significant role in linking the past of our place with the present. Um, you know, and I think about, you know, if we think about the injection of life that things like the silo art that has, you know, proliferated across the eastern seaboard, et cetera, brings to small communities, <clears throat> excuse me, whose, whose, you know, industry and agriculture has failed. And so these, these townships need things that are going to, you know, vivify the community and also help bring more to that. Glenn, I'm going to jump to you now because, um, you know, if we're talking about works that celebrate the region that they're in, et cetera, um, if we look at this, these images now, you know, once some of these from uh, the Warralili development that I'm sure quite a lot of us know. I, when I was thinking about this, Glenn, I was thinking about the fact that Warralili, you know, it's a name that we actually know. Like, so Warralili's what I think is built about 10 years ago or completed about 10 years ago. Um, and yet it's already something that we know and we we can call Warralili a place and we know where that is. And that's quite, if you think about that, that's somewhat different to some of the other developments that have happened uh, in our own area of the world recently where we they, they're still not identifiable. So, Glenn, I wanted to ask you what were the aims of this project and also about the ways that the works direct people through and within space? Um, well, I gather the aims are different can, uh, depending on who you're talking to, but I would probably suggest for the developers, um, the aims were to draw people to a specific area. Um, the aims for, and to give a hint of something, like if you're doing the 60 or 100K experience, um, something that's on the side of the road that may draw you to a specific place and space. Um, the aims of the urban designer, um, which is Jeremy Minter, um, and the landscape architects were obviously to create a, a story within that narrative and have that story of what is now Warralili threaded throughout the whole community. So to give people a sense of understanding that where they're um, residing, where they've chosen to live. And for us, it was about our interpretation of that particular place and what has gone before the community that is now starting to flourish there. So um, I'll, I'll jump in here. So let's look at, for example, at this um, glorious image of uh, these structures sort of lining the pathway in the fog. Can you talk to us a little bit about what they represent? Yeah, so right, first and foremost, the um, photograph was taken by one of the residents there. I've forgotten her name, so I wish I, yeah, I just want to make reference to it. Is it's not my image; it's another photographer's. Um, but yeah, she 
was walking around there as you know, a lot of people do in the morning before work. Uh, in the background there, it's a <coughs> it's a big um, old stiper. Stiper is an indigi um, grass that's found in and around the area, and they're stiper seeds that have <coughs> blown from the stiper plant and started to um, spread. And it's, I suppose, our interpretation of a, a new community and um, it's sort of um, spreading and starting to germinate, so to speak, and, and take on a new life. So um, that's, that's where we've got that from. But it's uh, like, one, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, so it's like in many ways, like one, one of the things I notice about a lot of your work is that it's very immersive. You're walking through places, you know, and it's telling you different layers of story. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, that is probably the most significant approach I've found. And when I say I, we, I work by myself, but also with Mark Trinham a heck of a lot. And so all of these gigs that you see in front of us are with Mark and um, we, through our approach, of think the, the best way that we can work through a space and a site is to pay a little bit of homage to what has come before us and give people an understanding of the space and place they live. So that's working through layers of geology and geography, the local flora and fauna that, you know, have been there for millions and millions of years. So for us, it's, I wouldn't say a cop out, but it's, it's also gives an advantage in we're not being political in any manner. We're just saying what has been here and that's a way of being quite site specific and making things unique very easily mm, mm. um I, I really i mean for me when i look at your works it's very much about that thing about moving like the way it gets people to act in place and and that really is about the sort of the experience which is what rowena talked about to the experience the importance of the experience of art in public spaces um, Julie, I wanted to, as I just bring up the last of Mark's images, I wanted to talk, you know, and all of these sort of groundworks, the way we move through them, the many layers, you know, that are here, talking about, as you said, that geology. What's this gorgeous work with the, um, are they sleepers? Yeah, that one down there, that was working with, I'll, I'll just want to make sure, all of these are an interpretation, but it's also very much in a collaborative process. So all I'm doing is trying to interpret a space based on what the community would like to see. Yeah. And in this one down the bottom, it is working with the loggers up in um, the highlands of the Yarra Ranges, mm -hmm. and it's based on the old... Um, way up in the Arrow Ranges around um, there's a, a whole lot of old bushies railways that were up there and it's an it's an ephemeral work a lot of the the old railways were were laid down there with mountain ash and mountain ash doesn't last too long and so the whole process of this was the lifespan was only meant to be about 10 years, the life of what a general life railway was up there. And this is pre-steel um, tracks. And so that was a way for them to bring the logs down from the highlands down into the, the, the bigger mills to get sawn up and then put into the, the, the river system and, and sent down down the line down into Melbourne, I suppose, and distributed throughout Victoria, Australia and the world. So um, that was a way and it's, a, it's an inter interesting thing with that particular work because 
you're sometimes working through a, a process that doesn't quite align with your philosophy on things. And the, the loggers and a lot of the bushies up that way were pretty not too interested in the gig to start with, which is fair enough. Um, but it was a matter of bringing in some of the, the old boys up there and showing a way of splitting timber rather than cutting it and, um, and then how it was originally laid back a back hundred years ago. There's only one or two people that still remembered how to do it. And by the end, everyone was really interested and excited by it. And it became something that a lot of the, a lot of the um, industry up there was really excited to get behind because it became sort of like a, a museum reference, I suppose. Mm, mm. And it showed them what had been done through their community for, for about the last 100 or so, 150 years. But um, it, That's fabulous. Yeah, it draws reference back to using art as an interpretive space. And within there, there's a map of the, the little Yarra and the big Yarra as a junction and where it meets because it's at Yarra Junction. Yeah. And I suppose coming back down using the, the river systems for, for um, the way that they send their lumber down the line. Mm, fabulous. Can I contribute um, something there? Yes. That, yes. Um, What's really um, interesting about this work in the context of placemaking is, is that often the past of a, of a place disappears as a result mm. of education or in the case of rural areas, industries closing down or people moving on. And, and so the role of um, a creative project in that is, is, is anchoring that history through some kind of, you know, memory or memorialization and, I mean, that's a, it's a really beautiful work. I had no idea. When I saw that work, Glenn, a while ago, I always thought that it was an interpretation of, of the rail track. I didn't realise that it was actually what people push their carts along. Um, mm. So thank you for that. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to you, Julie, because, it, you know, you know that that the importance of the experience of public art of art in public spaces and i mean your work juxtaposes the undervalued or abandoned often to engage the audience with amongst other things questions of mass production and consumption and in fact i'd say also the value of critical thought um you know i'll stop here on this image tell us a little bit about so you work i mean you work both in the gallery space and in commissioned public works and also could we call them interventions? Yeah, I, uh, technically they're called unauthorised interventions. Yep. Basically means that they're not against the law, so they're not illegal, but there's no permissions have been sought. So it basically, you know, some people would call it guerrilla as well. So um, I, I do um, commissions, uh, but part of the play in public spaces is to take advantages of um, surfaces and temporary things and imposing and putting text on them. So go on, you're going to ask me. Yeah, well, I was, I mean, this one's really interesting, I think, because the, the quote that you've chosen to be free and to act are the same, you know, you've placed it on these bollards that, you know, came about because of, you know, an act of sort of awful violence in Melbourne. Do you want to, you know, what helps, what makes you select the sort of text that you use? Because you use text a fair bit in your work. Well, I am very careful about what text I use and, and they generally are, it generally is um, relevant and specific to the object that I put it on in public space. And in this case, those bollards were a real relief for people who lived in the city because everybody was very scared. And, and it's, they were also... Um, have an echo of concern towards terrorism as well, like international terrorism, rather than people with mental health problems that do ghastly things and so on. So people were really pleased to see them because they felt safe, but also um, they're an expression, they, they do actually limit movement as well. Oh. And, and they are a reminder that you're not safe. So they, they have a um, double function. So um, my work is always um, conceptual to some degree and will always attempt to bring out those 
paradoxes. Um, and this, this series of work was called Concrete Knowledge. And so uh, um, another artist and I, Nina Senads, who, who works with Bollards, um, did this series. And it was all about freedom and the fact that with freedom becomes responsibility. Because mm. I think that, I mean, one of the things I was concerned to um, convey in the whole series, it was a whole series, it was just one, is um, that dual responsibility. If you've got freedom, you've also got the responsibility. Well, but it's, that's that one. Uh, but it's also about the weight of freedom as well. Or if we mm. lose freedom, then um, we are constrained. And sometimes that's worse than having the threat of um, somebody mowing you down in Melbourne. Yeah. I'm going to move on to another one of your works, this one. So tell <laughs> us a little bit about your practice. Uh, well, this one was actually... I mean, a lot of the work that I, well, for 10 years, um, when in, in, when people dumped um, furniture around the streets, I um, would stencil a quote, and they were from thinkers and um, songwriters, or they were sometimes things that, quotes that people, or things that people told me in the street who were maybe marginal or fragile or homeless. So that series of work was about, um, you know, life circumstances and the fragility of life. Um, and this project is an extension of that where I collected, I started finding quite lovely chairs on the street and I collected them and, um, and developed this idea of please take the se your seat. So this was for Geelong After Dark. Um, and as we all know, when you go to festivals, um, <laughs> I always want to sit down. <laughs> My feet hurt. <laughs> so, um, it's a way of um, reviving an abandoned object. Mm. Uh, it's a double play on please take your seat. So the invitation is, is that at the end of the night you can take it home. <laughs> artwork and thirdly they perform a very important function in that when you want to sit down and in this case um, there were um, uh, projections there so it was a really good place to um, sit down and have a break and also enjoy the work sitting down rather than standing up with sore feet so apparently all of those chairs found new homes so it's also <laughs> about, um, <laughs> It's, a, it's about revaluing um, objects and that's mm. one of the um, things that art teaches us is, is, is um, an intervention with an object or a ready-made or an existing thing then revalues it and, and moves from trash to being art and in this case all these I things think would have gone to the tip would have gotten you home as art. I think that's so important to, um, you know, this discussion, that uh, that whole idea of it revaluing something, you know, whether it be a, a, you know, a lane way that, you know, people have been using for whatever purpose or to, you know, chairs, et cetera, to, you know, new developments, housing developments. Tell us a little bit about this one. Well, if I can just add to that too is, is that when you intervene with something in a place that you just walk past all the time, whether or not it's permanent or temporary, that that new thing then sh sharpens your focus on, on what's around it as well. So mm -hmm. you notice what's around it too. And so mm -hmm. in this case, I mean, it is a, obviously a photograph, but what comes into view is, you know, at the end of the day, the shadows that those objects may make. So um, I did this um, at the end of last year when there was a lot of attention. Or was it earlier than that? No, it was way earlier than that. I think it was before the election um, at, um, about children in detention. And, and again, this chair was just in my street. So I took it home and I did a whole, whole lot of them actually. And, I, and this one is placed uh, on, in Torquay where rules for refugees would often have stand, you know, and with their signs to encourage people to care about what was happening to 
children. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it, the nature of its sight is double fold, is that the light at the end of the day and the long shadows, you know, some things cast long shadows uh, that, you know, and sometimes they're, they're, they're implications of those long shadows, the consequences of acts, you know, go on. And for those children, they really are um, psychologically affected. Probably. Going to be carrying it for ever. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important aspect of public art, that it actually is actively working to engage communities and individuals in thought and discussion about issues. Um, Sorry, my Siri, I'm reading my notes from my phone and Siri keeps wanting to talk to me while I'm doing it, so I'm losing my notes. Staying with that whole idea of conceptual art, Glenn, I'm going to jump to you because you likewise, I think your work quite deals quite deliberately with, you know, thought and thinking in new ways and innovative ways. Um, Would you speak a little bit? Oh, Julie, actually, I'm going to come back to this image, but talk to us a little bit about about that, please, Grant. What is the, you know, what what is it behind, what drives your work? And how does the concept meet the fabrication? um, This particular work, in, on one level, it's just really simple. It's like a fragment of a, a tennis racket and um, the trajectory of a tennis ball. Um, it was for a tennis centre, I think it was in Nary Warren, if I remember rightly, um, city of Casey. Um, on another level, that um, woven mesh image I've been working with since the mid-1990s, I suppose it would be, um, as a way of representing um, the fabric of a community, if you like, or, or the way that we build community, the way the community is created. So I've taken a concept that I've been working on for a long time and adapted it to a public sculpture. Um, and its interpretive value is, is broad, I think. It can be interpreted directly, as I just described, or it can be read in a number of different ways, choosing on the individual. I don't mm-hmm. really um, see it any more than that, I guess. Um, you I you talked a little bit... Sorry. sorry. You talked I'll... a little bit more a little bit earlier about um, humour or, or whimsy perhaps would be another way to describe that. Yes, yes, I think it is a, an adaptation and an interpretation of um, of a whimsical nature of seeing how, how we interact, I guess. Yeah, I also find it really interesting. Like I, I will be honest and say that when I first saw this image, I was a bit bamboozled. Now, some of you might find it surprising. Sport's not really my thing, but you know, and then I read the title and then I was looking at it and I realised it made me see that you're working a lot too with um, energies and energetics, you know, and so this, when I saw this, you know, when I put coupled it with its title and I could see, you know, that there's also that energetic movement of the ball bouncing and then, you know, coming off at a different angle. And in some ways, you know, I think your work really does ask us to think, you know, it, it's a bit perplexing. It can be perplexing. And so it asks us to look, like Julie's, it asks us to look a little bit, you know, to perhaps go, you and know. What's really um, lovely about this um, from my perspective is, is that by highlighting the racket, the mesh on the racket, in this location, the context, all of a sudden you realise there's a bit of a, there's a mimic in the in the fence as well mm, the, the mm. fence that you know I wouldn't have thought about I wouldn't have thought about yeah, those yeah that's true that's true and, and, and also for me it's the process like the the act of making the mesh um, which was an incredibly difficult thing to do because that's actually woven steel pipe so I had to build a a loom that was going to weave steel wow. um, and I had to develop the process for doing that not because I wanted to weave steel, but because I had an idea and I wanted to express that idea as succinctly as I possibly could. Um, But through that process, I'm able to develop my own um, response to the whole whole idea, I guess, and it it, it grows and develops out of the act of doing itself, I think, Um, and that's really important to me. Um, And it's also... um, it's also a response to the notion of being involved with communities and working for communities, um, mm. which I've done a lot of. You know, my public art practice was born out of um, a 
a um, urban design program that we ran in um, regional Victoria, which involved extensive community consultation. And that's how I came to public art. Um, so I come at it from perhaps a slightly different perspective in, in that regard. That's a sort of a profound experience for me. It's um, interesting, and, isn't and it? All of, these, all of these works are, are some total of that, I guess. Um, all there's feedback. A, there's a, a, an academic called Barbara Bolt who, you know, if you, so, you know, Many of us here may have done um, master's degrees or, or whatever in, you know, which has, a, you know, has a creative research component. And this academic so level in fact. talks about the magic that's in the handling. And I think, I mean, that's what you're speaking to here, Grant, you know, like you, you needed to learn how to do this. And so the project sort of grows as you handle the materials, the physical materials. And I think each of you, you know, would definitely be working yeah. with that. You know, and part of that is also the community that you're collaborating, etc. It's the handling of the whole project, and that's where the magic happens. Oh, I think so. It's 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 often a battle. It's not necessarily a pleasing or pleasant experience. It's often a fight, and yeah. um, like with materials that are so resistant, like steel, for instance, um, it becomes in itself um, a, a, a radical learning curve, um, both conceptually and physically. This is fanfare. Where is this one located? And that's in Bannockburn. And what's its? What are these dancing characters <laughs> doing? Well, this was a this is a response to the notion of building a new community. I mean, for many many years, I used to drive through Bannockburn, and it was just a tiny little sleepy town that was sort of semi dying. And then all of a sudden, um, it's taken on this new explosion of growth. Um, and this was commissioned by a, a a developing company, a, develop, a company of developers. Um, and um, it was my response to the notion of the, the, in, the injection of um, a new housing estate into what was really a traditional um, farming community, I suppose, mm. in, on, the, on, on the Golden Plains, the Golden Plains Shire. Um, so it's also, it's both a celebration and sort of expressing at the same time a slightly sort of disjointed notion of um, growth and development as well, like we're having something imposed on them by a particular process as well as um, being able to grow the community at the same time. So a little bit of conflict, a little bit of, um, a little bit of angst, um, but also a celebration. Mm, mm. I'm going to um, move to your next work because I'm just keeping an eye, trying to keep an eye on the town. So I really do see that there's quite a strong element of humour in your work or play is probably a better description for it, Grant. Tell us about Leaf Delta. Um, this, this was a really, really interesting process that I went through for this. Um, this was funded by Vic Health um, quite a number of years ago. Um, and we did um, an enormous amount of community consultation. We did about three weeks of community consultation for this project. Um, and this idea was just completely born out of that process. It completely came out of consultation. Um, the name of the, it was a shopping strip that was dying. It was in a really um, disadvantaged um, suburb in, in Melbourne, um, Dovetown. I don't know whether you know Dovetown. Mm -hmm. Not well. And Vic Health had, had, de had deemed it a, a, a suburb that needed some revitalisation, I suppose, and this shopping strip was dying. So we went through this process where we consulted and we worked with quite a number of different schools. We had um, large amounts of community consultation sessions um, and designed this out of that process, completely out of that process. Um, but the real, one of the other really interesting things about this is that I spent about six weeks on site installing this sculpture and every day for six weeks, I had maybe six or seven times a day somebody driving past winding around their, down their window and screaming abuse at me um, day in and day out for six solid weeks, um, which really, really tested my mettle. Um, what am I doing here? Um, but I've got to say, by the end of that six weeks, when people had seen the pro at least the processes that were involved and the commitment that was involved, um, they came around. They came around and they took it on. Um, mm. They took it on through being exposed to the value of what artists can contribute to communities and how, how they can express um, a certain community value, I suppose. It's um, so for me, it was a massive learning experience and for them it was a massive learning experience as well. And at the end, we came together. Yeah. We came together and it was, 
And it's also, you'll, you'll notice that um, it really hardly ever got vandalised because people took on the ownership for that project. Yeah, yeah, so and I think that's a real... That's a real, um, that's something that's often found with public work, isn't it? I, I just had to put him in because he's very lovely. Oh, <laughs> red dog, yeah. This is another really interesting um, process that I went through in northwestern Victoria. This is one of three sculptures I did for the community of Warwick Nabil um, in their main street. Um, all of them are based around dogs. This is a Kelpie dog. Um, one of them was a dingo. Um, the other one was also a Kelpie that involved sheep. Um, I did a lot of consultation work up in northwestern Victoria in um, both Warwick Nabeel and Hopeton as well um, as, as part of this urban design project. Um, and many, many years later, they came back to me and, and said, um, can you do some work for us in, in the main street? They wanted to somehow express their identity. Um, and because in, in the early 90s, I discovered that I could actually do figure modeling, so I thought, I can do this. I can, and, and they were very interested in expressing their identity in terms of their farming community. And eventually, I got to put the dingo in, which was also um, also a reference to in, indigenous culture in the area, which um, um, hasn't really been recognised in the past. Mm. Um, so it's a progression, if you like, back in history. That, that sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, but that's what that's what actually happened. Rowena, what were you saying? Uh, did they ask for a Cobb Co coach at any point? <laughs> no, no, no. Like it was quite, it was quite free reign f for me in that, that regard. Um, this, this, this particular one here, I called Sentinel because it was facing down. It was facing north. It was facing down the street. Um, and the other one, which was interesting because of the sheep, there were six sheep that were identical. So at that time, they were talking about the um, the cloning of, of Dolly the sheep. And I also mm -hmm. called that one um, Molly, which was the name of the dog. The actual dog that did the modelling for me was model, Molly. So it was Molly and Dolly um, head north, which was um, um, an interesting <laughs> interesting play. And, and also an another interpretation of the whimsy, I suppose, that can be, that can be part of a sculpture. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to... They use these as part of, as as part of the um, as as we all experience, you know, like um, our sculptures are used as as expression of part of the identity of a local community. I'm going to um, come back to that point about commissioning and and the risk that you know a commission can pose for a public artist. Because Grant, I know you're not the only one on this panel who's probably been abused by passers by as they've as they've worked on public artworks. Would anyone like to, has anyone got any experience they want to share of, you know, how a commission perhaps, you know, yeah, the risk that can be posed? Anyone want to volunteer? Like one of the, I think a really um, good example of that for anyone who's from Melbourne or knows Melbourne well, obviously, is Vaults or the work that was known as the Yellow Peril. Um, you know, incredibly racist sort of, you know, Cold War type feeling in that, you know, that nickname that was given to that work. But I remember as a 10 year old being aware of the furor that, that, that erupted over that because, you know, and here was I living in suburban Melbourne and yet I knew like it was on the news, it was in the papers, it was on the radio as you went to school. And this-, this a, An interesting point there that nothing will provoke as much ire in a community as an artwork that certain members deem as being unsuitable, yet, you know, we tolerate the most awful and ugliest building without, you know, without a blink of the eye. And my theory is, is that often an artwork can be, a, it can be like a lightning rod, mm. that the frustration or there's a politic within, within a local area and the frustration of some of the community members gets channeled into it. So it might be, in my case, um, last year, I did a commission for a new community piazza and the shopkeepers were really frustrated that council took so long to complete it. And when it went in, that became the lightning rod of their, um, their um, dissatisfaction. And in my experience, I mean, that's that's probably the first time I've really copped it. Um, you know, some critical anger about works that I've done, permanent works. Yeah. Um, but my my 
well, my knowledge is, is that often um, works that are rejected initially often become embraced by the community as a result of familiarity um, of time and the way people use the work and engage with it. So um, in my case, it was three bronze deck chairs that were kind of tumbling like a little dancing um, um, uh, trio. Um, and so people can sit on it, I mean, and, and play on it and take selfies and so on. And I anticipate that over time, the kids in the school will have quite a strong attachment to it and it will no longer be considered, um, looks like old hard rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> And there's another point there as well, if I could make one, um, mm. that is that everybody, like interpretation of art is a completely subjective and personal thing. So everybody has an opinion. Um, and regardless of what the artist's intent is, everybody has an opinion. And that opinion is, is um, also willing to be vented um, freely. Mm. And that's just part of our as part of our job, really, to be able to deal with that the best way that we can. Um, is there something it's not easy, it's challenging, but sometimes you just have to be tough, I guess. Yeah, I'll, We have I'll, to be tough in a field that really requires us to, to draw on the sensitive side of our emotions to be able to create work, but at the same time we have to find some mechanism for, for surviving the processes, if yeah. you like. Um, is there something... In the public world. Also, that's... When... Grant, you're talking about processes. That's another important point is people see the final product, but they don't see the process to get to that product. So sometimes um, you, when you're making something, there's generally always compromises that take place, whether that's the infrastructure under the ground for the footings, whether that's the... Um, the budget meets timeline, um, whether that's the mediums that are chosen to use, and they don't see what it requires to get something up and into a space. And, of course, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but a lot of the times that um, opinion's ill-informed because they don't see the difficult nature it takes to get something into a space to start with. I also wanted so, to um, talk about the um, like the aspirational nature like for example Julie you mentioned that you know often a work can be well ahead of its time and, and Bolt again is a prime example of that a work that was hated by its city and sort of disc you know like moved from one site you know one sort of unloved site to another along the Yarra River and now has found a permanent home outside the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art and looks glorious in that setting. And the work, you know, we've seen replication and, and homage paid to that work, you know, in architecture and across our country. So is there something to in that? Like, and also you must find this, um, Rowena, because your work is so, it's, it's very abstract, it's hugely expressionist and people generally, you know, it's a bit like Jackson Pollock, isn't it? It's, you know, like my kid could do that. It's, I'm sure that's something that, you know, people have thrown at yep. you. Um, but part of this, there's an educative aspect to this too, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you, you kind of go out into the world as a public artist and know that you're open, knowing that you're open to critique. And that's probably one of the hardest parts about it. But I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing. Mm. But it does necessarily occasionally generate negative or and just any form of discussion like it's it's it opens up a can of worms to I don't know I, I just feel to think something there really? that, that the nature like a good work of art it what it's doing and how it's operating won't always be apparent within the first second that you look at it you yeah. know, it's not a Macca's sign. It's something way more complex than that. Yeah. And hopefully it's not a one-liner either where you just go, oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah. That a, that a good complex artwork work that's sitting in a, in a place with all of its, you know, social, political, you know, physical um, 
under underpinning and then also um, just sitting there and the way it material its material interacts with that space all of that isn't always immediately obvious and it and it peels out over time so the other reason why I think people all of a sudden become very fond of something is is because they're starting to get it and yeah like things slowly reveal themselves and they have an enduring in nature to them don't they indeed indeed and and the detail and 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 the intimacy of memories that occur in the space also add to that set of relationship to the point where often work that has been hated for example there's a work called Fido a giant wooden dog in Fairfield everybody hated it how do you spend that amount of money on it scandal scandal we should you know why are we painting doors instead of fixing rooms and then when they were going to decommission it, everybody howled. And that just- <laughs> well, I have a similar story. Like when my husband was painting a wall in rural South Australia, he had someone come up to him and say, council are wasting their money. They should be fixing the roads. And then seven days later, he came up and apologised and said that he was wrong. And it actually took that long. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fabulously short turnaround, I've got to say. It is, isn't it? Um, Glenn, I'm going to, so I'm just uh, keeping an eye on the time. We're just after 12, I think. Let me have a look. Yes, 12.02. So I want to um, just talk a little bit more about that whole commissioning project process because that's, you know, it's in that, it's there. Um, and what makes a good commission, you know? So what is, so if we, you know, if we, you know, if, if by any chance we got some developer you know we've got a lot of development going on in our area and there's not a lot of public art that's being um done you know side by side with it so glenn i'm going to throw back to you actually and talk a little bit more about Wara lily if we may oh i just had to put this image there grant because oh. it's, it's totally kooky and delightful and i thought everyone should that's see crazy. it yeah yeah <laughs> there's another stream of work that's another stream of thinking that i've, I've been <laughs> And it's still going. It's still going. These these walking objects. I've I've been doing them since um, 1990, I think. Um, and it's another example of how I've managed how um, my personal practice has influenced public sculpture. I mean, this was just a, an amazing opportunity I ever had to do this. I'm I'm still astounded that they. Um, this was um, Moreland City Council, I think, and it was over the old the the entrance to the old Brunswick Town Hall. So it actually sits about three and a half metres off the ground. And the sculpture itself is about four and a half metres long and goes through the facade glass of the building itself. Um, uh, I, I'm still staggered that they did that. Yeah, it talks a lot about... I'm incredibly community. privileged to have that opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely, but it talks a lot about the community too, doesn't it? That, that com- That's a community oh, that, you know, very yeah. happily embraces things they don't understand and is open to, to difference in many ways. Um, Glenn, I did I want still to... find it difficult to, to interpret that myself, really. Um, I think it's really interesting and, and thought-provoking, but I don't know whether I can put my finger on it. I'm still yeah. working on that one. Look, I just, you know, I, I just love the delightful kookiness of it. Like, you know, no matter what time of the day or night, if you walk past that, you'd really just have to, you know, it stops you and it asks you to think you know Mm. and and I think in a world where you know we talked about this on Friday Julie you mentioned this you know in a world where we're saturated with sort of screen content that doesn't ask us to actually do much critical thinking I think anything that's sort of in the public space that just you know makes us stand back and think again is is always a good thing Glenn I wanted to come uh come back to this because this was in in many ways you know I think this was a hugely successful project. And I think what I said about the fact that we recognise Warralilly as a place now with only, you know, in only a decade or so since it was built is when we look at the way that of urban development, you know, I think that's quite remarkable. Um, you were brought in very early in this. So I think you'd say that this was a very successful commission and partly it was because you were brought in very early into the process. Is that is that true? Yeah, absolutely. And um, like all great processes that takes a, a team behind it and um, have to say when it come to the team, Jeremy Minter, who was the urban designer and GBLA, who are the landscape architects, they um, 
they were fantastic to work with and they sort of had a similar headspace to Mark and myself in relation to what they wanted to achieve within the space and, and the stories that were needing to be told. And um, in doing it, like he was quite um, understandable in making sure that it it's, well, not all good works need to swallow up space, but he was quite prepared to put a, a, a bit of um, space within that to tell the true story. And it just so happens that um, along with a whole lot of other initiatives that took place that it end up getting um, quite a few national awards um, for environmental excellence. And, and that's, that's fantastic for them because on a, a tangible level from a economic perspective, it just gives credence to what they're wanting to do, which is obviously um, market their development. But it, it just um, when it comes to the brief, it was relatively open. Um, it was up to us to work through and with um, Jeremy and GBLA what we saw best represented a whole space because it does it is a large area and there's a number of different stories that take place from the Barwon Heads Road through to the Torquay Road mm. and it's drawing on like a theme using Armstrong Creek to bring all aspects of the layers of history um, in relation to the creek and the geography um, and what's taken place there for for thousands and, and millions of years and, and just once again getting back to community expectations and how they can therefore get to understand the space they they live and and start fit and being told from Jeremy himself how um, they they're proud of that and in turn it that's the intangible is is putting a for them, a economic value on on a feeling. Mm, yeah, yeah, and it's that, isn't it? Because that's one of there's that really interesting sort of gap between public art and what you look at, but also what it's that we come back to that immersive feeling. But I just so I wanted to um, just stay here for a moment, though, Glenn, because can you tell me so? A lot of developments these days, there's you know, if public art happens, it's sort of at the back end or at the final sort of end of a developmental process often. This one, they, they invested early yeah. and, and well, and now they've got this space that people are really happy to live in and call their own. Yeah? I, th I think over the last 10 years, but even you could say the last five years, like when it comes to urban design, whether that's planning, through a park, for a council. Um, we've been brought in with a landscape architecture team at ground level and people are starting to realise the value of what a, a, um, a uh, someone with more of a um, conceptual mind can bring to, bring to a team another layer there that, that in our mind is absolute and we don't quite understand why it hasn't been done a lot before that but it is becoming a lot more um, within the um, EOIs that we're involved with um, a lot of different landscape architects are putting um, public artists in their team um, just so they can bounce bounce ideas often through the, the layers that create a particular space. There's something about that. I'm sort of opening this up to everyone again. There's something about that, isn't there, the fact the way that artists can touch human emotion and, you know, the sense, the bodily, you know, bodily, like our, our experience in our bodies, you know, how public art can do that. I'm throwing again to another one of um, Rowena's works. You know, and just you can imagine sitting in this space, you know, if it's a cold, drab 
day outside or whatever, you know, there's a really tangible sort of, you know, it's lit up again. It's like that stained glass, you know, your heart sort of swells. In the colour of your skin as well. So you're going to notice your hand and the person that you're looking at as well in a, you know, because they're going to be bathed in a different light, whether or not you're conscious or it's an unconscious observation, it, it is affective. Um, Absolutely. And it's, very, and it's delightful when you look down and you see pink hands. Yeah. <laughs> Your own hands are fresh. <laughs> um, I'm going to, this is going to be my last question, everyone. So if you are there in the audience and you're eager for me to shut up, I promise I will be in a moment. Um, but I'm going to throw this question is for everyone on the panel. And it's just because I think that, you know, it's good to, to vision things. You can't begin to, you know, dream things until you vision them first. So I did give everyone a bit of a heads up that I wanted them to answer this question. Uh, and, of course, my notes are just losing. I'm just losing myself in my notes again. I suppose my question was, and we'll start, where will I start? I asked somebody, and one of you can just jump in. So my last question before the audience gets a turn is, so let's imagine that you've each been given free reign to create a work for the Surf Coast Shire. You can do it anywhere you like and it can be about anything you like. Uh, Glenn, starting with you, what would you do? Um, well, understanding to start with that I've put about two and a half minutes of thought into this. Um, <laughs> not too much research involved, but two thoughts. One would be a very small, intimate homage to the Jangicetus, which was a now extinct pre baleen whale that was um, discovered off one of the beaches within Jan Juk. And it's the only species found ever, um, and there the name comes into play, Jangicetus. It's um, unique to obviously this area. Um, and somewhere up along the, the track up there, um, and maybe it's so small that one in every 100 people see it and get an understanding for what has taken place prior to um, them stepping foots in the feet in the area, or the other approach might be out the front of a large hardware uh, <laughs> hardware shop, or maybe at the front of um, a multinational um, food chain at the entrance to our beautiful town. A massive, big. Um, maybe pink, pink flamingo or something that <laughs> got absolutely no relevance to the area. Once again, paying homage to neo or well, post neo plonkism and um, <laughs> showing how urban design, big, massive facades at the entrance of our beautiful town um, has taken place for a while and Urban planning are quite happy to um, go along with it. I'm going to jump. Thank you for that. I, I very much like the phrase post neo plonkism. Um, we might drill down into that in another session. Uh, where will I jump? Julie Shields, what would uh, you do? What would I do? I would like um, it to be white artists uh, all through the Shire along the coast to address the fact that the sea levels are rising, to address that concept and to make a temporary artwork. So it would be like an art trail and, and the oceans are rising and that's a very critical and important issue for um, us and I think we're all forgetting it, um, no wonder because of the virus, but the sea levels are rising. And then my suggestion would be is, is after that, that series of work that's gone in if there's one that's really good and really strikes at the heart of the community then that would be um translated into a temp into a from a temporary work into a um permanent work 
Thank you, lovely. I'm taking notes. Is anyone noticing? Grant, what would you do? Oh, look, the first thing I would do is consider amount of research, and it would also depend whereabouts in the Surf Coast Shire we're talking about. I Anywhere suppose because you I live, well, from my point of view, it would be a matter if it was more coastally um, connected or it was more to do with the rural community. But because I live close to the rural aspect of the Surf Coast Shire, I have had this idea where I'd like to build a, um, a stack of giant hay bales, like maybe three or four tall in a zigzag pattern, similar to the um, steel columns that I have got at Bannockburn perhaps, but make them actually um, model them to look like um, to look like big round hay bales. Um, maybe you know, four or five high, so it'd be quite, quite a tall sculpture. Um, and in between one of those, in between the gap of one of those sets of, um, of hay bales, I would like to put a little black cockatoo. Just sitting there trying to feed but being threatened and challenged at the same time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, as a response to the notion of how we interact with our landscape, you know, how we treat our landscape, it's a bit yeah. like the, um, the global warming we're talking about um, and, and how it's threatening our future and the future of the whole planet. Well, also the way that we um, deal with um, our farm spaces is critically important to the future of not just the human race, but all of, of our global environment. So it would be a, a statement about, um, yeah. about environmental, our environmental, our need to be environmentally aware and um, to continue the fight for, um, for improvements in the way that we deal with our landscape. Okay, everyone, I'm about to jump, jump to Rowena, so I do hope you've got your questions ready. So Rowena. If you would be given any space you wanted in the Surf Coast Shire to do whatever you like with, what would you do and where would it be? Well, I mean, I love doing big work, so if I could get a big wall, I would embrace it. Um, be but bold. I, I, would, I would like to, I guess, I love doing gateway pieces and, like, highly visible works, but I would hope that if I ever got to do something, it would be within the context of a whole series of public works that can create a sense of connectivity throughout a town, which is a little quite, quite disconnected in its planning. So, um, yeah, I'd like the idea of setting the scene that you'd be arriving at a town that has exciting things to experience. Beautiful. Karen, I'm going to um, turn back to you now. Uh, as I said, I am taking notes. So um, Rowena's going to do it. A huge scale entrance gateway. What town, Rowena? Well, uh, I guess Torquay Springs to mind because that's where we are. Thanks. That's great. Okay, Karen, can we get you back? Do I need to stop sharing my thing? Oh, I think um, I think I'm back. I yes. Um, actually, that's a, an awesome segue to a comment from Rose from Facebook, who's. Um, who said that we've got so many talented artists in the surf coast, let's find space, full stop. Great. <laughs> there's, a lot of, you to that. there's a lot of support for that. <laughs> um, and another comment from Faye, it's interesting that when towns are dying, uh, we turn to art to give it life. Um, I think that's, and that, uh, then that we turn to art and artists to fix or solve some of our issues. Yeah, that's I think an excellent a, point which is an awesome comment as well. Um, got a question from Virginia for Rowena. What's Rowena's engagement with graffiti? And how do you see your work pinching the edges between art and gestural expressive marks on walls? What would your comment be on that? Um, well, I don't engage in graffiti. Um, all the public works that I do are commissioned and um, I guess my work comes from the school of abstract expressionism and has derived from my studio practice and expanded to the public space. Um, I guess the context of it being on a laneway wall might give a reading of graffiti to some people, but um, I sort of see graffiti a little bit as a claiming of space, like a territorial claiming of space, whereas I feel like what I do is activate and um, give life to a space that may, may be quite drab or um, 
yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel about, um, well, anybody actually, because um, when you're trying to create a piece of art for a space, I've I've worked in several community development arts projects and there's a really fine balance between uh, community consultation, community input, but then also an artist's vision for what you want this piece of public art to look like. And I was just wondering, do you have, does anyone have any tips on um, if artists were thinking about creating some kind of public art piece or working with community, do you have any tips around how you negotiate that balance and still involved so that the community still feels like they own the project and you're building the community? as well as expressing your vision for that space as well? I would probably suggest, I mean, there's a million different approaches, but one that I found really, really difficult that sort of faded out a little bit sort of 10, 15 years ago was the 100 brushes technique when everyone within the community had a chance to put their mark on a particular space pretty difficult and it's great for the people involved but for the rest of the community it might be seen as sometimes not all the time as a little bit of like a dog's breakfast um, but I think it's really really important to get the as much community consultation and research through the concept and design phase and have the threads of information some of them uh, super obscure that come from someone that doesn't feel they've got a right to tell a particular story and that might be the thread that gets put into the foreground but hopefully to have everyone an understanding that your comments contribute to a piece but it doesn't mean what you say is going to be the piece. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, can I it's add fantastic. That that, that um, I personally state clear of any public art outcomes that are permanent when working with communities. We were talking the other day about how hard it is to um, have some works out there for so many years uh, after you've moved on and that, or, or that maybe because of the, the circumstances or or the forces at work, it's not as successful as you would like. Um, equally, it's really unhelpful and unproductive for, for community members to have an artwork out in public space permanently that is not well received by the community. It's too hard to manage. So if it's temporary, then it's fun, you know, then it can be whimsical. There's way more opportunities to take risks and good art usually comes from taking risks and daring to fail and then if it fails it sort of like it's not there for 10 years so that's that's i also think as a um, facilitator in that um that realm it is actually really important to assert the fact that you are you know you have experience at, Gently, obviously, and and the, and knowledge, and um, you know everybody can kick a football, but nobody's you know can be an AFL player, as an example for that you know managing that democratic tension that often occurs when working with communities. Everybody's creative, yeah, but some of us have a bit more experience at it. I and think it's interesting. To, it's just like, you know, the more public art people are exposed to, the more they're going to be willing to accept and things. And you go to those cities that have embraced public art, you know, and I think about cities like uh, Valencia in Spain. I don't know if anyone's been there, but they've got public art, you know, so it's a very old city, you know, with, you know, ancient walls and stuff around it. But there is public art in almost every, you know, site. It's murals, it's sculptures, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it it looks extraordinary in that space and is completely embraced by its community because it's not one thing on its own left there to sort of carry the flag for all public art. And it teaches people too, I think, that you don't you don't have to get so worked up about one thing either. 
you know. And it's growing visual literacy that occurs as well, that people get much better at, at going, what's that? I don't know. <laughs> well, the artist must be stupid or I'm stupid because I don't get it. Whereas if, you know, that's, I mean, that is a position that people take, but, you know, with exposure and, and um, you know, well, I think it's with exposure and people talking to each other and not being told what, what or how to respond that eventually that visual literacy grows and is illustrated in your example. Wonderful. I also think there's a need to make a distinction between art and a community and community art. I think they're two different things and they serve two different purposes. Yeah. Um, and they can coexist and some of my more successful projects have involved coexistence of those two processes. But um, we are engaged in projects because of our knowledge and our understanding um, and that should be recognised and, and embraced by these um, opportunities rather than um, compromised, perhaps. I see that we're heading towards the end of our session. So I did want to end on a note and talk about a, a project that I learned about a few years ago. Um, so everyone, if there are more questions and things, we're going to continue these conversations throughout um, this month. So, you know, keep feed your questions to me. If you have particular questions you want the individual artists to respond to, please get in touch with me and I can um, feed that out. But I was going to, I'm going to take us to Kalgoorlie now because uh, back in 2014, when a young 14 year old Aboriginal boy was killed, um, he was mowed down in a vehicle by a white man who thought that the kid was stealing his motorbike. Um, and that caused extraordinary racial tensions in Kalgoorlie, understandably. And when the driver only received a minimum sentence for accidental death or something like that, um, it really tore that town apart. And lots of businesses closed down, so many shops in the, the main street, et cetera, et cetera. And then a, a cultural producer sort of came in and she started working with artists and with Aboriginal families and groups and they started to, they, they dreamt up a mural art festival. And it, you know, they brought artists in, they were both local artists and artists from Perth and things like that. They brought them in and they went about and they painted all of these murals on empty shop fronts, on the empty windows, et cetera, et cetera. And they, what happened, they then had a, you know, they had tours. So local kids were taking people on tours on this weekend of the works, et cetera. The artists were talking to the works with the community. That's now grown into, there's been two years of this, it's called Heart Walk Festival, Street Art Festival in Kalgoorlie. And it has completely changed the way that that town operates. It's brought Aboriginal and settler communities and mining communities together in ways that have never been seen in that place and it's completely transformed that community. So I just wanted to leave you with that, you know, we want to leave you with information about the power of public art and what it can do. We don't have any of those issues. We're so lucky down here on the surf coast, but we've got our own things that we need to think about. And I think Glenn was right when he talked about, and Rowena about, you know, how much development and stuff is happening. And so, you know, we do really need to think about how that's impacting our landscape, how it's impacting the people in our place, and how we can really, you know, own, you know, have have that sense of ownership over our communities, and you know, you know, things that excite us and visual stimulation and things. Um, so, everyone, thank you. We'll, we're going to end the session with this video, but thank you so much for being a part of this. Thanks for trusting me and you know, navigating this space with me. Um, Glenn, did you want? Grant Fink says to everyone, negotiation and more negotiation. I totally agree with you. Glenn, did you have anyone got anything to say before we close out? Oh, just thanks for the opportunity, Harriet. Appreciate mm. it. My pleasure. The platform to actually have this discussion. So, mm. And with each other as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, love that. Fantastic um, opportunity. Yeah, look, thank you all, really. It's been fabulous for me to learn more about your work individually and um, fabulous for our, you know, our residents and things to learn more. And I've taken notes about all of your proposed projects. 
I remember <laughs> I've, got, I've got I've got IP on the pink flamingo, Harry. Don't, yeah, yeah, don't you worry. And the sorry, <laughs> the post neoplonkism. Don't you worry. That will definitely have a TM beside it or a copyright beside it. If I, you know, when we use it. But everyone, thanks again for joining us. Please take a look at Portal's program. We've got so many things going on in August. It's unbelievable. Next Sunday's session will be the making of the Surf Coast Arts Trail. I think I just I just jumped in and took Karen's role there, didn't I? It's all right. Um, yes. Don't forget to yeah tune in next week for yeah the history of the Surf Coast Arts Trail and um, yeah conversation with Julie Dyer, Pat McKenzie, and Cinnamon Stevens talking all, everything Surf Coast Arts Trail and our studio tours launch next weekend as well. So check so for all of those artists that have been out there making studio tools and things because we can't travel to each other's studios thank you so much we're really looking forward to seeing them next weekend and um connor if you would please play the video and everyone have a great sunday thanks again and um see you see you Bye. again oh. Walk's a two-year public art project. It was designed to inject a massive amount of artwork into our CBD. In the first week of May in 2017 and 2018, we installed around 30 murals each year. They're all combined together in a walking trail that's packaged up in a little map that you can pick up from CBD outlets or from the visitor centre or download online. There was nothing like it ever attempted in Kalgoorlie Boulder before. I was given advice from supporters in town and said, why don't you just try something, just start something. The initial idea sort of came from seeing a lot of empty shop windows in town. And so the first vision of Heartwalk was to paint murals in empty shop windows. The fact that Art Gold was really well established and able to assist meant that the project could mobilise really quickly. There was significant components that were funded, but there was also a massive volunteer base. So it was kind of a nice blend. Being able to get the investment behind us and the support behind us to just scale this up and do something massive, it just shifted the way that the town felt about itself and the idea of what's possible for us. The response from the community was massively positive and they just wanted to see more. They just wanted more, more, more. There was such a thirst for this kind of work to be happening in our town. I think the success of this is it, it's bringing together the community. We've got so many people here with so many skills. Being able to trust different people that are locally based to all come together and work towards a common goal, it was really awesome and just why it worked so well. I think it just gives community a sense of pride. Like everyone's come together, like we've all got something in common. Especially this year with all the Indigenous art, it's just made a big difference. They're sharing their stories, we're sharing ours. Everyone's sharing their stories through their artwork. So there's a lot of conversations happening between locals and the artists. The area of Calgary needs a lot more cultural flavour to the place and this was one of the great ways to, to do it. The Aboriginal community uh, were very supportive, they loved it. It was people going past in, in buses and cars and yelling out and whistling and goggler dreaming and, and really proud that this is their culture that's being put on display. There's people walking the streets, all different types of people, everyone kind of coming together because they've all got something in common. It's been absolutely wonderful to watch it progress from being a project about addressing an issue of blank windows to being walls and then to a street art festival. Things can be a little bit elitist in some aspects of the arts, whereas street art breaks down a lot of barriers. It doesn't matter what your income is, what your fears are about entering an art gallery or an art centre, you can actually just access it at your time. You can stay there as long as you need to stay there. Some exhibitions are only open for a certain period of time. You might miss it, you might not be able to get there. Street art is there 24-7. I just thought it was so crucial that Kalgoorlie needed to have a huge whack in the head and a huge influx of all of this work because it really 
change perceptions in a really short amount of time. It's just a daily positive feedback, just every day, whether I get people coming in with their maps and they've told me about amazing murals they've seen, or during Heart Walk they got to speak to the artist while they were painting. Just constant positive feedback. It's just a, a wonderful, wonderful project. Just seeing the amount of work that artists are getting as a result of there being a huge demand for mural art now in Kalgoorlie. A lot of artists have then gone on and gotten commissions for different pieces and so it's really done a lot to stimulate the economy here I think for creative work. We want to brand ourselves moving forward as a, as a vibrant and progressive kind of community and one that's really inclusive. The main thing that I hope that people would take away from Heart Walk is that as an individual in a community, you do have the power to do something. If you see that there's an improvement to be made or a problem to be solved or fun to be had, then there's no reason why you can't rally the resources behind you to try and make something happen, whether it's small or huge.